and I feel like I was able to be, you know, under the shadows of such magnificent women who are just mm. breaking barriers and that really opened good, good doors for me and um, I think from a manufacturing entrepreneurship perspective, you know, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but I'm like, you know, have I made a difference for my daughter at least? The other day she was like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I was like, no. <laughs> but then <laughs> I realized from her perspective, she's like, but you're doing it. So it's possible. Yeah. She's my only, a special lady. She's the only one. Salam and hello everyone and welcome to the show. As always, my name is Lily Bakala Piper and I'm so glad that you've tuned in today. So I'm sure many of you started out 2023 with high hopes to get in shape, you know, meet some fitness goals. Maybe some of you like me have these high, high ambitions of running a marathon or at least a half marathon one day. As an Ethiopian, I definitely have grown up with the stories of the great runners from our country, from our region. Growing up, one of my favorite stories that my parents would tell us was Ababa Bakila's Olympic triumph in the 1960 Olympics, where he ran barefoot and defeated every other contender to win gold in Italy, which has very sweet, you know, poetic justice for us as Ethiopians, when he conquered the running world that year and did it again barefoot. What a story that we hold on to. And as members of this East African running community, we are blessed with runner after runner, story after story, hero after hero, who we can look to have really inspired generation of runners. And beyond Ababa Bakila, for me personally, my dad is a runner. He runs six to seven miles every single day and has done that for years. He's now in his 70s and he still runs. And Abba, if you're listening, I just want to tell you, I appreciate you and love the example that you've set for us and all of us about how to take care of ourselves through running. Well, if you are a Kenyan resident, if you are part of the diaspora, I hope that your running story also includes the story of Enda Shoes. Enda Shoes came onto the scene in the 2010s and gave us a chance as East Africans to buy a shoe designed, invented, conceived here on the red soil of Kenya and the region. What a story Enda has become. It's a story of empowerment, a story of innovation, a story of taking the running legacy and really owning it and claiming it for ourselves. And today on the show, I am just beyond thrilled that the founder of Enda Shoes, Navalaya Osamba Ombati, has joined me today to talk about the story of Enda of how she left her work in the United Nations to create a shoe that would be as good as any other global brand and really take the running legacies and bring them home for every single one of us, not only here in Nairobi, but beyond every border across this beautiful continent. So salam and hello, listeners. You are in for a treat. And please help me welcome to the show today my guest, the founder and director of Enda Shoes, Navalayo Osamba Ombati. Navalayo Karibu Sana, so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. That's such a great uh, intro, actually. Uh, oh, sometimes okay. I listen to it and I'm like, is that, is that what we did? But, you know, um, I appreciate that. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here, actually. Oh, it is it is my pleasure and honor. You know, I one of the things that I love about the stories we're trying to tell here, not to toot my own horn, but mm -hmm. I could just have a show every day about the innovations and the creativity and the ingenuity that is happening here in East Africa. There is just a story for every day of the week, every hour of the day. And your story is one that I'm so delighted that we get to bring to our listeners today because I have been a fan of your work and a fan of Enda Shoes. And for those who are watching on YouTube, I have to stand up and show my Enda t-shirt here as Ooh. well. <laughs> uh, just so happy that you are here today to tell us the Enda story. So congratulations, first of all. Let me just start there with all that you have built the last Almost decade, is it, that you've started this uh, company? This is our sixth year, like sixth officially. Year. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's been a long journey still. So you're turning the corner towards that decade mark. Yes. So for those who don't know the Enda story, Navalayo, please give us the highlights of your journey to creating a world-class running shoe. 
Um, yeah, in summary, I think I've always kind of like grown up around sports. Uh, my dad was in the military and as you know, in Kenya, the military is one of the few employers that actually employs people for sports. And that's why a lot of the athletes kind of come either from, you know, the defense forces or the prisons or the police. And so, you know, kind of like growing up, uh, runners were around me. I mean, you know, they're just people, you don't necessarily identify them as, but it's one of those things. And going to school, you kind of have the soldiers running on the road. And, and stuff like that. And so, you know, they were part of my community. And I also come from a, a small village near Eldoret. And so Eldoret was like the big town when we were like in the village. And so that's can, that town has basically been built by the proceeds of runners. And so sports has always been in my life. And I think, you know, when I was trying to think of what I want to develop a business in, in terms of developing impact, sports was right there at the top of the list mostly because i do think that it has capacity to be a high gdp earner and also it has the capacity to you know give people agency to create employment as opposed to wait for employment sports can do mm. that and so i knew i wanted to do something in sports but coincidentally I actually started in tennis because tennis is also something i want i really really like and i was blown away by the fact that um, you know, there's, there was no African in the top ATP 100. Uh, and this, I was kind of like, when I was doing my postgraduate, I think it was around 2014, and I got to see the commerce around Wimbledon and how everything works. And then I looked at the price money and I was like, why are we running when we could play tennis? <laughs> <laughs> like this could change an entire town or something like that. And so I, I was asking myself, why don't Africans play tennis? And I discovered, you know, certain reasons and that tennis is an early sport. And so when I came back home from my postgraduate studies, I decided to start a tennis academy because I thought, you know, let's fix this because tennis is going to have to start when you're really young. I ran it for two years. It had lots of problems in retrospect in terms of just the conceptualization and it didn't work out. Um, but I was basically working with five, six year olds trying to see if we can kind of like start um, developing them. And so when that didn't work out, I was like, okay, maybe tennis is not it. Um, what can I do that can, you know, still is in sports? So I went into an accelerator program that, you know, I still remember them looking at me like tennis. Hmm, okay. <laughs> like, uh, but I appreciate the ability to work with me and, and kind of just say, what, how can you create a bigger, more, bigger impact that lasts longer? And out of that process, running became the answer. And then when you're looking at the running business, you're either in apparel or in footwear or in uh, nutrition. And it just felt like, uh, you know, apparel and nutrition were like easy entrance and no offense to the people in that business, because I know now it's very hard. Anything that looks easy is hard. Of course. And so it just felt right to work with the tools that every runner needs, which is a uh, shoe. And, you know, of course, in as much as we're talking about the Kenyan legacy, there's also the Ethiopian legacy. And it's just, you know, there's something about this region that produces really good runners, despite not having the technology. So can we leverage on that to, you know, challenge the international market and say there is actually possibility to create a brand from uh, from Kenya? And that's uh, basically the pivot from tennis to running. And from then on, we basically uh, the key thing was, so my co-founder and I met my co-founder in that uh, business accelerator. And the key thing was none of us had shoemaking experience, so we needed to find a team uh, to do that. So we really spent a lot of time searching for the right talent, who, you know, someone who's designed and it's not going to cost us a lot of money uh, to get to prototype. Then we go to prototype and we realized we needed more money to kind of go into mass production. Uh, getting finance in Africa, as you know, is really hard. Uh, yes. especially if you don't have security as to act as collateral, or you don't have like big savings. And, you know, the footwear industry is very intense from a capital perspective. So we decided to launch a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. I think that was one of the best decisions we, we ever made. And that's how we basically got the capital to start. We raised about $140,000, which was just enough to Amazing. get started. And yeah, that's how in a nutshell, how Enda came to be, and now we're just building it. Amazing. Well, you're just building it. I mean, you're saying you're making it sound so humble, but really <laughs> you're, you are shaking things up on every level by both, you know, this ingenuity. I just love the imagination and the, 
I don't know what it is. There's like a tremendous, not even courage, like this confidence to be like, I'm going to make a shoe. I'm going to find the right people. We're going to design it. We're going to make it. We're going to build it. When you were doing the Kickstarter campaign, mm-hmm. how, what, what story did you tell to get people to buy into this? Because I, I want to know that must have been some story. Yeah, I think one of the things that really resonated, and I think we we realized that we were not only just telling a story from our perspective, but that the world needed to hear this story. So it was like a two-way perspective. And we're just basically saying, you know, from the best runners in the world comes the world's best running shoe. Because you, you know, like, how can you beat that? Absolutely. But I think the, on the other side of the aisle was also the recognition by everybody saying, you know, come to think of it, like, you know, that deserves to be a running shoe from Africa, that deserves to be a running shoe from Kenya, even Ethiopia, because they have developed that skill set to a point where they're still unbeatable champions without the resources or technology. And so there's something there. And that, you know, resonated with the world. And that also was an easy story for us to tell because we had that conviction. And yeah, that was how we were able to kind of like sell and get money in advance to start making the shoes. Yeah. yeah. I love I love that connection. We are the best runners, so we naturally have something to offer the world and teach them about what the rest best running shoe could be. I, I just love that. It's a natural, obvious connection. So let's yeah. talk about your first product that you put out, the Eaton. Mm-hmm. Am yeah. I saying that correct? The Eaton? Yes. I've yes, got some are. right behind me here. If you're yeah, watching the YouTube see. version, you're seeing it. I uh, love the colors. We're going to talk about the design a little bit later. But tell uh, me, what was the reaction when this when this product first hit the market and people got to see it, touch it, feel it, wear it, most importantly, got to wear it? What was that first reaction that you were hearing? Uh, the reaction, I think, was pride. I think because we baked into the E10 a really story that was about Kenyan running culture. So we named it after the town in Rift Valley that has produced, you know, the highest number of champions. It has 12 lines on the side to represent 12th of December when Kenya became a republic. Um, you know, the back side of it has a groove that kind of represents the Rift Valley. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> and then I love it. it. <laughs> yeah, we have the word Harambe at the bottom because, you know, we were crowdfunded hey. as a business. It's all about, you know, yes. coming together to achieve <laughs> what is impossible as an individual. And then, of course, our logo is the tip of a spear. And a spear mm. is very symbolic in African culture uh, in terms of, you know, pride and what can be able to do. So I think. More than that, it was, uh, and I always say, you know, as an evolution of the company, we we tell stories and the shoes are just a product and we hope to kind of, you know, con, you know, branch into that. But the whole idea was, let us use this products, not just to, to run, but to educate the next generation, mm-hmm. because I do believe that shoes are works of art. They are, you know, they're things that can educate and can improve on things, and especially this generation. Um, not really to blame the generation, but also there's a lot of laxes of really good books on Kenyan history and African history and kind of like pull them back so that when someone holds a shoe, they learn something. And I think that really resonated well, you know, with the diaspora, with Kenyans themselves, with Africans. And that's also was when we realized, you know, we're not just a Kenyan brand, we're actually an African brand. Yeah. Oh, you're giving me chills, Navalayo, because I just am so I'm so moved and touched that you wanted through a shoe to teach, to inspire, to instill pride. It's like you were building a flag. You know, you were trying to put mm-hmm. all the symbols there that meant something to you as a Kenyan and, and give that to every single person who would put this on. I just think that is so incredibly powerful. And it, it does make me think how much responsibility you must have felt that you couldn't just put a shoe together and throw it out there, that you no. really put so much thought and care into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, history is one of my favorite subjects. And, you know, they say those who do not understand the history are bound to repeat it. Uh, those who are not rooted in history don't know themselves. There's, there's a lot of stuff. And then there's also the African culture where, you know, I think we've been, a lot of our history has been misplaced or retold, but mostly because it wasn't written. And not being written was not necessarily a bad thing. And I'm trying to kind of like bring that back and say we had our own way of doing things, which was mm. art, poetry, storytelling, all that kind of stuff. So can we do that again in a way that connects our history and knowledge so that people can know, you know, from one shoe or the other shoe, there's always something that we are telling. But at the same point, staying true to the African way of 
communicating our history so that we don't have this gap where just because it wasn't written it doesn't exist we are basically saying let's go back and find out what was told but never written and let's retell it again Ooh. If, if there was an audience they'd be snapping their fingers <laughs> for you right now because that is just a hundred percent just mm. truth upon truth um so let's talk about some of the names of your shoes my, yeah. my cousin actually has a shoe company in ethiopia and he's kind oh, of done something fantastic. similar to you yeah it's called <laughs> mz they do they do leather kind of oh i know enzy what a small See? world <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's my cousin oh, so wow. you know wow. he's named some of his shoes like the lumumba uh mm -hmm. different things like after african leaders and you've given special names to your shoes to la patette we've talked about the eaten already the name yeah. of the company itself is called enda which has yeah. means go yeah it's Swahili. tell me you know you've already talked about kind of the storytelling that goes into it Who's the team behind making these calls on the naming? Do you have a big table where everyone's pitching <laughs> names? How does those decisions get made? I wish. <laughs> no, I think one of the things that we really have going for us, which I think is our core strength, is we have a really strong community, like our community is diehard loyal. And one of the things is, especially early on, even the logo and everything, we always used to put it out on a poll on the mailing list, what do you guys think, and then we'd get feedback. So I remember when we wanted to name the shoes, we were like, okay, this is the story we want to tell. These are the names we are considering, of course, you know, the big five, the Great Lakes and stuff like that. And someone was like, well, it's a running shoe. It's the first running shoe company. Why not just give it a name that is about running? And so the first name was actually, you know, like we were steered by our community. The second name was actually a community member sent us a video literally saying why we should name the shoe La Patette, which was very fantastic. Yeah, he actually sent a video and say, you know, this is what this word means. It's the word that you hear a lot when challenges are just about to run, like you hear lavatet or lavat, like, you know, and so mm. that, that passion for the community to basically come and say, uh, yeah, like we, we, this is what we think. Uh, that has been our really key strength in terms of just coming up with the names. Uh, the last one, which was a trail shoe, that was purely me. Uh, we called it the coup before uh, so cool before again is an archaeological site North Kenya it has a lot of historical things and I'm like you know I was doing a poll among the 19 25 year olds and I was like do you guys know what cool before is and they're like what is that and I was like exactly why we need to name this shoe <laughs> so Fantastic. that they need to go and find out what that is so it's been a mixture of mostly the community and just the team and basically saying what story do we want to tell with each shoe You've clearly hit on a nerve amongst the, your your community followers who are, like you said, diehard about the shoe and passionate about it. What do you think it is that's resonating with people so much that they're responding and sending you videos? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think I think it's been how we built the brand. I think we were very honest early on. And it's something that I want the brand to keep on doing, uh, even as we grow, like we didn't have money and they say, hey, guys, we don't have money. This is what we are thinking of doing. Would you support us? And people say, yeah, we would. And you're like, OK, if you really think you would support us, here's a list. Put your name and let's see how much you can raise from us. And people did that when we were almost not hitting our targets. We were like, OK, guys, you know, we, we need people to come with their laptops and just sit and email everybody they know. And people kind of like showed up. And wow. so I think it's only, it's been because we have been able to show what we are doing and how we are building it because it's not easy. And I think the community, and that's not the reason why the Harambe thing is so special to me, because it's really about if you, what you cannot do as an individual, the community can do for you, you know? Mm. And so that has been Enda in a nutshell that we've always said, guys, we are stuck or guys who made a mistake or guys, you know, mm. and the feedback from the community has always been like, you know, we know it takes time um, let us help and figure out. But sometimes there are those people who are really angry, but I think generally most of the time uh, we've been able to do that. So definitely the community has carried us and um, yeah, I hope that's something we can now take, uh, you know, continent wide and uh, global as well. That's incredible. That's just incredible. So let, let's talk a little bit about some of those challenges. There has been mm -hmm. so much discussion in the last few years about 
the potential, the promise, the talent that exists in the region, yeah. we've known that it's been here. It's not new information for us, but it's like yeah. the rest of the world is waking up and looking over and being like, oh, by the way, there's this whole continent there full of really talented people. Yeah. Um, and in the process of that, there has been a lot of exciting investments happening, but in some recent articles that have come out, they've kind of exposed that a lot of the investments coming into Kenya and into the region, while they may be based here, the actual in, uh, organizations that are securing funding, especially for SMEs and startups, and, and especially in the tech industry, mm -hmm. tend to be led by non-Kenyans. They tend to be at the helm getting these million dollar investments. Uh, in fact, there was a, a Quartz article that came out in 2021 that said only 6% mm -hmm. of startups that secured more than a million dollars in Kenya were led by local founders, only 6%, mm -hmm. which is just astounding. Yeah. Um, so Tell me, as you know, as a Black Kenyan woman who has founded and led this company, you mentioned a co-founder earlier, um, you know, what has your experience been in both starting Enda, securing funding, you talked about the, the Kickstarter and whatnot, you know, and what do you see ahead for you to continue to maintain the growth that you need to see in, in, a, in a space that is quite complex around yeah. funding? Uh, yeah, funding is complex. And I say it's complex because there's always what you see and then there's, you know, kind of like lift the curtain and kind of like see the mechanics of it. And I would say the reality is, yes, uh, you know, a lot of foreign owned businesses get money much more easily and in much bigger checks than you would find ordinarily like local businesses. But from my experience, I think I've seen a couple of things. One, of course, there's the familiarity bias, you know, like, um, you know, like now I'm like, oh, she's from Ethiopia. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, like there's certain <laughs> things that bond us, you know, from a cultural perspective. I think a lot of VCs and a lot of funders have acknowledged this bias. So there's really a rise of uh, funds that are specifically saying we're investing in African led or African owned. So the first reason is there was that bias where people who are kind of like homogeneous find it easier to work together. But then there's also been, because of these reports, which have been very good, um, there's that recognition of there's a bias and we kind of like need to bridge that bias. The second challenge I would say from a funding international perspective is that the language of funding is global and the language of SMEs is local. So, for example, hmm. from my experience, you know, the first time I met an investor who was like, where's your cap table? And I was like, what is that? You know, I had no hmm. clue what he was talking about. But in other sense, it's just a list of who owns shares in the company and what percentage and stuff like that. But right. I kind of had to learn that there's a specific language, you know, the the convertible notes, the simple agreement for future equity, like there's some things which are quintessentially American or European, which they expect as an investor that that's basic knowledge. But if I'm just, you know, in Nairobi, putting my head down, I just kind of like went through the system and the, the national local system never really encountered this stuff. There's always that mismatch in terms of, okay, I don't know what these guys are talking about. They don't know what I'm talking about. But the challenge of that mismatch is you might think that someone is ignorant, like, or they don't have the information, but I do think they do have it only in another sense of, you know, how they understand it. And so are investors patient enough to understand what that is, right? And then conversely, yes. in as much as, you know, we are talking about uh, people having access to funding, I think it's also important for founders to also realize that you know, not all money that comes in is good money. And especially if you have that knowledge gap, you're on the disadvantaged side because then you might end up signing stuff that really costs you big time. And then there's also the perspective of uh, sometimes, you know, someone is kind of like investing in dollar amount and you feel like that's a lot of money. Like if I say, okay, $20,000 and you're like, oh my gosh, that's like what, 2 million? Okay, but now the exchange rate is really good. So maybe yeah. <laughs> And so we don't really look at long term, like you can be great at your idea, but terrible at finance or accounting. And so you need to look at it long term. Otherwise, everything looks good on paper, but then you found like you sold your company at a much lower rate, not like sold it, but you gave away most of it. And so I would say that's why I was saying this conversation is very complicated, because even sure. if we open the doors, doesn't necessarily mean what's coming through the doors is a good thing. And especially because we don't have that legal and technical expertise. And 
a lot of these firms remember are you know they're professional so they have professional lawyers they have professional accountants and CEOs and you're dealing with a company that you know the CFO is probably a friend of mine or if I'm lucky enough to have a CFO so I do feel I'm always like it has to be measured. Uh, it's not necessarily just let's open the doors and let's get funding. Um, on the other side, I would say that, you know, there's definitely need, especially in Nairobi, to expand circles between locals and expatriates. I do feel, and this is from my experience, that there are different uh, groups. Um, and, you know, some of it, most of it is expert and then they're local. I don't know why they don't mix. I, I, I tried to understand. In the investment space, in the entrepreneurial yes. and investment yes. space. Yeah, yes. okay. There hmm. is. And hmm. so the, the challenge is in one space, there's a lot of information sharing and stuff like that in terms of, oh, I need someone. Oh, like, like I'll get this. Oh, I'm having challenges with. So I feel like the expert side has a lot of more information and resources. And the, the other side, because I was able to kind of like straddle both, was more of um yeah let's just commiserate how miserable this startup world is <laughs> and i was like why why is there such a, a dissonance you know and so i'd also yeah. say the networks uh, are a huge part of why you know you see those um you see where most some people are getting more funding and others are and because the networks the quality of network is also who's opening the doors for you who has the information uh, you know, like, oh, if you go to this particular business school, you're going to be able to go into this and that. Uh, there's sure. that. And my last point is also just from, a, uh, again, kind of like being Pan-Africanist, I'm always like, okay, good for them, but what are we doing about it, right? Where is the diaspora money? In most countries in Africa, diaspora is actually, you know, remitting much more money than local right. taxes collected. Right. So we are sending money home, but we are not investing in businesses. And the good thing about diaspora is that we understand the challenges, you know, like I can rip you off, but not too much because I know she's, you know, <laughs> she's <laughs> struggling me. and we're trying. And then there's also the culture, the cultural um, understanding of what it means to operate a business uh, in Kenya or in Ethiopia or wherever, where you understand those little challenges that kind of come up. And I don't think some of those challenges are understood by um, people who are not necessarily grown up or they haven't grown up or had the experience of living um, in Africa. And so my challenge to this has always been, and it's, it's not necessarily an answer, it, it's an and, you know, like this is a problem and not a but, but there's also a huge thing of, you know, we have lots of rich people in Africa. Where is that money going to? We are losing a lot of money to corruption. Why can't we lose it in a business, you know, as a risk of Absolutely. we tried and we failed? And so while I do see the challenge of, you know, this funding not going to African funders, I'm also like, you know, no one's coming to rescue us. We kind of have to figure out how to do this and expand this and get the the richer class to basically not just invest in property. I mean, there's only so much you can get in life uh invest in the next generation otherwise it doesn't matter how much money you have when you go outside the world you're still a black person you know yeah, you're still yeah, open yeah. to all these other experiences that i think are you know intrinsically linked to africa's condition and therefore we kind of have to be part of the solution you know it's interesting you started off a little while ago and telling the end of story saying how your community has really been there for you and been part of your story and a part of your journey yeah and i I really think that as your community grows, some of these solutions that are so necessary for the problems that small businesses, growing businesses are facing, I hope that they'll be, that, that community will start to encapsulate these individuals, right? That yeah. as the community grows, that more and people join that movement because there is definitely this sense, at least uh, I feel it in Nairobi of like, buy Kenya, build Kenya. Yeah. You feel that momentum, right? But that means you're going to spend a little bit more for... Yeah that product, that dress that you're going to buy because it's a Kenyan brand made by somebody, you know, who you may know, then it is to go to, you know, toy market or to go to whatever shop is. is so you're going to have to pay a bit more for that, which is yeah. to your point of we're going to have, no one's coming to rescue us. So we have to do it for ourselves. So tell me, you know, for you and, and Enda in terms of your shoe in this local market, mm -hmm. What do you, what, what, how do you see placing your shoe? Because it's a great quality shoe. I have to say your customer service is outstanding. I ordered my shoe. I had my shoe within hours. They're so wow. responsive. It's easy to get your products. <laughs> I'll pass the compliments to them. <laughs> 
please do, please do. Um, but tell us, you know, how are you situating yourself also in the local market so that maybe some of that, you know, that, that ecosystem can also start to hopefully respond to some of the challenges that businesses like yourselves are facing in this global market where investment really is needed. Yeah, uh, and I'm just saying this because again, having gotten out of Kenya and now trying to build it at a higher level, it's a different view, you know, it's uh, sure. Yeah, because before I was like, yeah, let's kind of like buy Kenya, build Kenya and because nowadays it's not but, but it's like and sure. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm challenging myself and I'm thinking, you know, I go to Rwanda, it's uh, buy Rwanda, build Rwanda, South Africa, buy South Africa, build South Africa. I think it is a good movement to start. But I think uh, we kind of also have to expand that to buy Africa, build Africa, because I think one of the challenges is that, um, and this again is my personal opinion, that we have, we always tend to go towards national identity. And I think, you know, the past 50 years have shown us that that's not the way forward. Like we have to mm -hmm. figure out how to do that. So of late, I've really been thinking about the buy local movement and I'm thinking it should be buy local, but expansion of that local to, you know, continental wide so that it should be by Ethiopian, by it should be by black, basically, sure. you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because then we end up choosing one over the other. And I do think like unity is the answer, uh, but this is another whole conversation. But I would say, you know, local support is critical and it's part of the reason why, you know, as a brand, as like no matter where what we do, where we go, we have to be rooted in Kenya. Uh, because it is fast, it gives us our authenticity as, a, you know, as an African brand. And I think being part of the community is important because they'll tell you, oh, nowadays you're feeling too sweet for us, or, oh, no, we don't like your product because of this. <laughs> like, they will give you that feedback. And I feel like that feedback is important to reign in the brand so that whatever happens, we are constantly aware of how we develop the brand. I think if we lose that connection, then we are, you know, homeless in quote and yeah. quote, I quote the Swahili saying, he who doesn't have a home is kind of like homeless. So mm. it is there and I, I'm, I, it's, I'm kind of like supporting it, but I think of late I've been stepping out and thinking it has to be wider so that I would also choose, I can choose to buy, um, you know, uh, a Lesotho and a Kenyan product as opposed to, no, I'm just gonna buy the Kenyan product because I'm supporting home. It kind of has yeah. to be uh, bigger than that. So. I support yeah. it and I think, you know, the market has definitely kind of like done that. But for us as business people, we also have to make sure that we're making products that are affordable to the market because at the end of the day, um, we know you look at purchasing power parity, you look at GDP and there's only so much people can buy. And so, but then the other side is that unless you achieve a certain volume, it's difficult to manage costs. But I think we have to make it affordable as well. That's the challenge in us as producers so that people can afford the shoe at maybe 5K or 6K, that's like 50, 60 bucks, as opposed to like 100, um, which is like 10,000, yeah. So that's coming, that 50, 5,000 shilling shoe for the Kenyan local is coming. Uh, yeah, we've been working on something. It's kind of hit a few snags, but it is. But I think for me, the key thing is I don't want anything to be perceived as, a, oh, we just did something cheaper for you. It has to be really good quality because we deserve that quality first before we for give sure. it to the world. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I can attest to the quality of these shoes and it's worth the investment. Your product's also available in the US and in Europe. Yes. So yes. people should definitely go to enda.com. Check it out and see the the, the 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 range of products that are available. Did I get it right? Is it dot com? And that's sportswear.com. And that's sportswear. Fantastic. Yes, because yes, once again, I also have a t-shirt. So there are other products there, not just shoes that you can get. Yeah. So I also want to know Navalayo. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we are featuring this episode during International Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. Tell me how being a woman in this space makes you excellent at what you do. Um, so in the, in this space specifically, the biggest consumer is actually a woman, right? The running shoe industry, women are buying more, women are running more, women are running slower times, which means they're not running to win a race. They're actually just running to keep fit. And women are making decisions, not just for their families, but also for their kids as well. And so, um, having a woman as a customer is actually really essential because they cover so many broad areas. And so it's important for me, at least, to 
for, for a couple of reasons. First, to be connected to this consumer group that is knowledgeable, that is making decisions for themselves and for their families. And then again, from an African perspective, um, you know, it's always a bit complex from a cultural perspective. But I do think there haven't been many women, um, you know, it's we kind of like fizzle out somewhere when it comes to leadership for, for various mm. reasons. Mm. And I would say the running industry has improved. I think over the past two years, we've seen, you know, with Atleta, for example, like we've seen women kind of like coming up to the top, but it's very much been very heavily male dominated, heavily white dominated. And, you know, I think it's just a fresh thing to see something that's different. And we're not saying it's different from a perspective of, oh, by us because we're better than them. I think it's also like, uh, you know, there's space for other people too, for other women. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that an industry that is that looks so defined cannot be entered into. And I think for me, that's uh, super important. And, you know, from a professional perspective, um, the ability to pursue your dreams, even when you still have your family, not kind of like lay them down and say, okay, now I'm just going to be, you know, wait and give up my dreams and follow them when the kids are grown. I think for me, it's more of like, you can try to do both, uh, of course, with certain safeguards, but it's really a matter for me of, you know, it's possible. I have seen it possible and I actually do owe my career to a lot of women who are badass, like, oh my gosh, mm. I think I was just so lucky to like have these women like in my life. Give, uh, give us and, some shout outs, Navalaya. Who are the ones that uh, have really, you know? Uh, I would say one was uh, Julie Nyangaya. She is a partner at Deloitte East Africa. But I think I started at Deloitte as an intern very young. So she really shaped my idea of like, why, why shouldn't you do this? Why, you know, like, I remember one instance where I was kind of like afraid of moving upwards because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in charge of these guys who are like so significantly older than me and stuff like that and she was always like but why like why does it matter if you've done your job well you know continue to do your job well so yes. yeah i think just kind of like seeing that success and seeing her kind of like do that and really always consistently beat her targets was it was a really good uh, intro for me um now there's also another deloitte partner called uvi patel she started the same time as i did at a level higher but she was also very consistent from a perspective of quality and doing what it requires to be done. And you know, now she's partner and I'm like, you know, I've seen that career trajectory. And last, uh, there's a lady from Ghana. Uh, she's called Edem Wosonu. She was, um, she is now a director at UNOCHA, but it was really just that hunger of being with someone who's like, why not you? Like, why can't you do this? And why can't you do that? So they really pushed me and, you know, when she went the extra mile to actually come and say, I'm going to guide you on how to do this. And she didn't necessarily have to. And I feel like I was able to be, you know, under the shadows of such magnificent women who are just mm. breaking barriers. And that really opened good, good doors for me. And um, I think from a manufacturing entrepreneurship perspective, you know, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but I'm like, you know, have I made a difference for my daughter? At least the other day she was like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I was like, no. <laughs> but then <laughs> I realized from her perspective, she's like, but you're doing it. So it's possible. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. So I think we need more women so that it gives us the nod to kind of join. And it also shows us the how, because a lot of times we'll say, oh, women can do it. But if you have someone who has done it, they'll tell you, okay, this is what you need to do. Fix your house, make sure this is done. And, na, 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 na. and so it's easier to learn the how of how to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. What's made you excellent in part is other women. And that's yes. so powerful. That's so powerful. Thank you for that. So, you know, I have to ask, um, mm. Navalayo, are you also a runner? Um, I, I run, but I don't run with the athletes, man. They, they will finish. <laughs> you run in private. You run in private. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I can do like a decent 5K and, you know, like, uh, but I think the, also the thing with running, the, what I really respect about it as a sport is the discipline. Uh, yeah. I think it's Eliud Kipchoge who said only the discipline are free. And I was like, ah, I feel that, you know, Beautiful. <laughs> because, yeah. yeah, because it's not, um, you kind of have to beat yourself and the self is always, uh, I don't want to do it, this sucks, you know, like there's always that thing in us that is, you know, inherently does not want to do what we need to do. And running is that thing that once it's in your blood, like 
you feel okay i didn't go for a run today your body is almost like we need to do something yeah and that's so what my he, dad says he says he yeah. feels unwell if he doesn't exactly. run he says, I feel unwell yeah exactly and so that feeling forces you to do it and then after that you feel so good and so i'd say that discipline is the thing that i admire most about the sport and a lot of us see the athletes in their glory but there's a lot of grueling work that goes before that and i admire that a lot that you know these guys are just ordinary guys you know and they're able to do what is required yeah, yeah. so you mentioned you mentioned our our hero and uh, statesman elir kipchoge kipchoge oh my goodness let me get that right <laughs> kipchoge <laughs> uh-huh. have you have you heard from any of the great runners from the region have you had any of them try the enda or have you had any interaction with them Yeah, I've had interactions with many, especially recently at the New York Marathon, like the place was teeming with like athletes from all over. Um, but, you know, there's also that thing where a lot of them are in contracts, a lot of them can support us publicly. And, you know, I understand it, you know, it's the same thing for us doing as a, as a brand. And that's also why it's so important to be connected to the athletes. They're like, I, you know, this should have been done many years ago but you know i have like 2 years to make money for the rest of my life so i'm going to give you feedback <laughs> you can yeah. see you know so i would say we've had really good support but now the next thing for the brand is to really step up with the new upcoming talent so that we are not just at the mercy of the 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 greats but also we are creating the the next greats so that mm. we can give them that opportunity and i also think the sponsorship sec- sector needs a uh, competition because everybody is either you know Nike or Adidas at least now there's a new entrant on running but i think uh whenever you have an industry that is very it has very few players who have monopoly then it's also open to abuse you know and so that's something i want to change where you know we are able to offer an athlete uh you know a contract that allows them to bargain and it's fine if they don't end up being um you know like an ender athlete we did have one who actually were like it's fine but at least we helped you up the price mm. a little bit in terms of that um and that's also why the brand is important because it's not just about you know me 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 let's win 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 it's also how can we help these guys to get better money for their back you know and say yeah yeah actually have something else i'm considering and you know they get maybe a couple of thousands more uh, because right now uh, the competition is intense the you know the coaches and the agents are few and that is an area that is very open to abuse if not checked so we kind of have to create mm-hmm. alternatives yeah well i hope any athlete who is listening to this will put if the end is not on their radar that it will be on their radar because what a what an honor it would be to again I, like i said at the beginning it feels like you're building a, a flag you know when you're building these shoes and what an honor it would be to run in these shoes and i have no doubt it's just a matter of time that the next great will be in enda shoes when they cross yep. the finish line we're working on so, it we're working on it <laughs> i believe it i believe yeah. it so tell me you know for you navalai what's your wildest biggest dream for enda you know what do you see coming up next Um I'm thinking I think for me it's more of you know like an athlete in like a major event like the Abbott races or the Olympics would definitely be top of it. I think when we get our people and by that I mean African to kind of like wear that product and for the whole world to be like what's that you know I feel like that's it. Mm. That's that's really it for me. I feel like I would be like okay we finally did it. That's the that's the stake i want to put at the top of mount kenya or mount kilimanjaro yeah, yeah. Say, that's it for me my job's done next person can carry on the next thing i think to just kind of like see that um that would be really really fantastic for me that's awesome well yeah. the olympics are next year i think right 2024 yeah they are they are okay. right now it's kind of like it's it's a very uh, It's a very legally complex process if you're not an official sponsor. Okay, but you I know, see. we're trying okay. to work with other smaller brands to see what the loopholes okay. are and what what we can do in the context of what's um, allowable. Well, I I also want to just take a moment and, and pause and say amidst all of the kind of national things and global things that you have to do to build a brand, you're mm-hmm. also investing back into Kenyan mm-hmm. companies by donating a portion of your profits. The company is carbon neutral. These are extraordinary things, Navalayo, really. I mean, there's so many people who are just <laughs> Sorry, easy that's... to meet. Yeah, oh, no, no, I just no, think no, it's no. awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah no I was laughing because I think you're saying that and in my mind I'm like thinking no it's not but I I guess you know it's also to acknowledge the 
the difference between and I guess you know what actually it is because I'm thinking why did we do it first was to set a blueprint for other companies right and again going back to history how have we built the world how have we built Africa extraction wealth accumulation and we usually are at the branch uh, the, at the bad end of the branch where the extraction is being done and so I believe that in future when you're talking about development it cannot be based on pure extraction there has to be a social element where it is for the communal benefit of how do we do that and so when we were creating the company I was like I wanted to give back um, I wanted to give back I want us to give back money because I've been in the shoes of not having money and I'm like who's doing a fantastic job let's find them let's give them our support let's help them do that if that helps them get to the next level so it's also just a thing of you know we know there's need we know there's scarcity of money if we can tap international markets channel back that home that would be fantastic and then it's also looking at the challenges of the current century global you know global warming is a it's a big deal you know like the us uh at least uh northern jersey hasn't had snow i think the first stretch of winter they haven't had snow you know the ice bags are melting uh the heat is and we intense. feel it like, here too yeah the, yeah the worst drought in 40 years yeah. exactly so we we cannot do business with that whole mentality of i just want to grab as much as i can for myself and then everybody else will sort themselves out and so being climate neutral was more of can we get more african brands to also recognize that it's not just about making money but because in you know i feel like in africa we are as part of being poor we are always trying to get rich you know, and mm -hmm. so, and we are not really thinking about what that means. Uh, and the other side is that because you know the developed the developing countries are poorer, we bear the brunt more. We don't have the safeguards, we don't have the response mechanisms, and so we can't just business can't be usual. We have to step back and say how can the private sector work towards um, you know either accounting for their global footprint or you know making it up or just something so that the either what you're creating you're also working on the other side to fix but ultimately not creating an environmental impact or damage and just say you know if i'm explore if i'm cutting wood in a forest i need to cut three percent that's fine let me not cut 70 percent just because i can and so exactly. i think we need to rethink about how to do business in a way that's sustainable and so enda is to show that that's possible and also to encourage other brands to follow that as well well, thank you. I mean, donating, you know, 2% plus of your profits being carbon neutral is not small at all. It's huge. So thank Thanks you. For the reminder. Thank you for modeling that for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and I want everyone who's listening to this to know that. I mean, I think all of us are trying to make better decisions, I hope, as consumers about where we yeah. put our money in. And definitely for Salam and Hello, this show is about about joy and justice and so there's so much joy in seeing your products and I feel like you are bringing so much more justice to the space by the ethos by which you're running your company so before we let you go I gotta yeah. ask you two questions which is mm. the way we always close our show Navalaya what is your favorite drink huh <laughs> I was not expecting that <laughs> um, I'd say I cook uh a very cold ah. soup but i know it's very yeah but i don't have it frequently because i have the ability to drink too much of it so i i would say i drink it less than 10 times a year so maybe that's why oh. it's you know okay so yeah. you really enjoy that cold cold i really get do it. so but i limit it because i know my capacity yeah but i say that a cook <laughs> is, is good for me okay and lastly yeah. before we let you go please tell us what is bringing you joy what is bringing me joy I think it's hope for the future. I, I struggle a lot in the present, but I think if we can be able to achieve the work in the present, then we change we change uh, our how do you call it? We change our probability for success in the future. And so that gives me you know energy to go through difficult days because I'm like if if going through this task will mean we get even a one percent chance of success then it's it's worth it so that that gives me energy to continue well thank you so much yeah. we look forward to the end of story continuing and growing and taking over we will be cheering you on here from nairobi and all the other spaces where we'll be watching so thank you so much for being on salam and hello today it's been such an honor thank you for having me
It's been such a joy. So listeners, please make sure that you check out endasportswear.com if you haven't already. I'm sure that many of you have already uh, checked out her work and bought the shoes and, and have it on maybe even right now as you're listening. But also let us know what you thought about the episode. You can always find us on all platforms at Salam and Hello. That's Salam with an E. And of course, we would love it if you would rate or review our podcast. It actually really, really helps us out. And please also send us a message, uh, Lily at salamandhello.com. We would love, love, love to hear from you. And until we talk again, have a wonderful week and be easy, y'all. See you soon.